Um, good morning or good afternoon, depending on where you're joining us from. Uh, my name is Yavana Knezhevich, and I'm the Associate Director of the Center for Russian, uh, East European, and Eurasian Studies here at Stanford. And it is my pleasure uh, to introduce today Bathsheba Demuth, who is Assistant Professor of History and Environment and Society at Brown University. Uh, there she specializes in the lands and seas of the Russian and North American Arctic. Uh, her prize-winning first book is called Floating Coast, An Environmental History of the Bering Strait, which was published by W.W. W. Norton and was named Nature Top 10 Book of 2019 and Best Book of 2019 by NPR, Library Journal, and others. Uh, Professor DeMuth holds a BA and MA from Brown University and also another MA and her PhD from the University of California, Berkeley, just across the bay. Uh, and her writing has appeared in publications from the American Historical Review uh, to the New Yorker. So we're very pleased to have you with us today and we very much look forward to your presentation. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you so much, uh, Giovanna. It's a real pleasure to join you virtually. Um, I do wish that I was enjoying November in the Bay Area rather than November in uh, Rhode Island, which is somewhat colder than I imagine uh, you're experiencing um, if you're in the South Bay. Um, but it's a real pleasure to join you this afternoon. Um, I'm going to pause just one second here to share my screen. Um, make sure that pops up for everyone. Um, and what I'm going to do this afternoon or this morning, depending where you are, um, is talk about some of the historical issues that um, the research in my book touches on um, that allows me to kind of geographically move around quite a bit. So if you know more about the United States or more about the Soviet Union, there will be something in here for you, hopefully. Um, and if you're just here for the whales, there's that too. I should also preface this talk um, with two disclaimers. One is I have a puppy in the house and she is uh, known to burst in usually at the most inopportune moments very loudly. So hopefully there's no puppy um, or maybe hopefully there is. And secondly, just as a, a disclaimer upfront, this is a, a fairly carnivorous uh, talk. Um, I. I do not mean to offend any vegans or vegetarians in the audience, um, but the subject matter at hand is kind of necessarily one um, with quite a bit of gore. So I'm gonna start, um, although this is a, a historical talk this afternoon, um, in the spring of 2017, so not all of that long ago, um, when uh, a whale like this one, a bowhead, swam north around St. Lawrence Island, which if you look at the um, map on the bottom of the screen, is the little dot in the middle of the Bering Sea. This whale was massive. She weighed um, around 70 tons, um, was almost 60 feet long, and was probably between 150 and 200 years old when she died. And over that lifespan, this whale, like all of the bowhead whales that live in the Bering, the Chukchi, and the Beaufort Seas, did work that made these bodies of water more alive. By surfacing and diving, whales churn nutrients through the water column and plume the fertilizer of their dung um, into the oceans in ways that go on to feed kind of the entire food chain as exists in the Bering Sea. This starts um, at a, a microscopic or almost microscopic level with kind of the, the basis of all life in the Bering Sea, the diatoms and algaes that do the photosynthetic work of fixing sunlight into carbon in their cells and do so much of this work, particularly in the summers in the Bering Sea, um, that they make it one of the most rich marine ecosystems on earth. Some of these diatoms and algae get picked up um, in massive schools of krill which are the little photos and our little uh, crustaceans um, and tiny fish that swim in schools around the Bering Sea, have this pinkish color. Um, the krill go on to support um, a very robust fishery in the Bering Sea and huge migratory bird populations. And then in turn, the krill are also the choice food of bowhead whales. But bowhead whales, um, 
in addition to kind of supporting the ecosystem when they're alive, also have kind of a, a critical role even when they die and fall to the seafloor, um, a phenomenon called whale fall. And if you want to take a few minutes um, of just kind of pure uh, academic nerd joy, you can look up this video from the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, um, where one of their undersea cameras happened upon a relatively recent whale fall, which is not a common phenomenon, and was able to see um, the vast number of species, some of which live only um, on the skeletons of fallen whales kind of in action. So there's an entire ecosystem that whales support even when they're dead. And that whale work um, extends out of the oceans and into the world that people inhabit on the coasts. Um, this work of making um, the, the seas more abundant and a kind of work that exists um, or that, that is noticeable when it's absent. And along the the coastlines of the Bering Sea and then up into the Chukchi and the Beaufort Seas, for several thousand years, whales have been critical species to supporting human populations. Excuse me, that's the sound of my puppy, as promised. Okay, I'm back. Um, so the, um, this, this will become more humorous later when I start talking about the agency of animals, given that this particular animal has a lot of agency in my life. Um, the agencies of whales in this particular case um, includes the ways in which they sort of directly materially supported people along the Bering Strait. Going back thousands of years, when the ancestors of today's indigenous populations, um, the Yupik, the Anupiak, and the Chukchi, um, made settlements and homes along the Bering Coast. Um, by being able to live with and live off of bowhead whales. This kind of dependency on bowheads is also true in the 21st century. Two summers ago, or actually, sorry, four summers ago now, um, it was true when Chris Passingbach, um, a Yupik young man living on St. Lawrence Island, harpooned the bowhead whale that I opened this talk by speaking of. At 16 years old, to make the first strike on a bowhead whale uh, to, that would feed his family and the dozens of other families in the community of Gamble, where Chris lives, was a moment of great pride and honor. The village of Gamble, which is a majority Yupik community, is allowed six strikes on bowhead whales per year by the International Whaling Commission. And these strikes have a great deal of meaning. First of all, it's actually possible to go hungry on St. Lawrence Island without whale, as the Gamble store is an incredibly expensive place to try to feed yourself. It costs me 40 or $50 a day there just as a single person. Um, and that's if there are sufficient supplies to feed everyone, since the store is stocked primarily by airplanes that are themselves subject to the incredible vagaries of Bering Sea weather. It's often pretty bare on the shelves in there. And beyond this, this kind of necessity at a basic caloric level, killing whales and being able to feed people with their flesh um, is as any person who might be in this audience knows, makes a person a provider, a sustainer and a full and competent member of their community. Chris Passengok is not a particularly talkative person, but when I was on St. Lawrence Island in 2017, his cousin explained to me that hunting whales was labor understood in Yupik country, not just as caring for people by feeding them, but as an act that sustains the relationship between people and bowheads that has been extant in this part of the world for as long as people can remember. And this means that putting the first strike on a bowhead whale is a transformative moment in a young Yupik person's life. So Chris Passengok did what any teenager might do in 2017 in a great moment. He posted that news on Facebook. It was on Facebook that a man named Paul Watson found Chris Passengok's post. Paul Watson is a man who's willing to go very far for whales. In the 1970s, as a founding member of Greenpeace, he put his body between Soviet factory whaling ships and sperm whales off the California coast. In the 1980s, 
he snuck into Siberian waters in an attempt to document the use of gray whales in feeding fox farms um, and other Soviet collectives and very narrowly evaded capture by the KGB. In the early 2000s, he starred in the reality television program Whale Wars, where he tracked Japanese and Icelandic factory ships and tried to disrupt their whaling activities. And by 2017, he was a fairly controversial figure. Greenpeace's website, for example, formally disavows a connection with him in the present, but he's also very popular. Watson had thousands of followers, some of whom were celebrities. And Watson saw Chris Apasengok as just another whale killer, describing him in his own Facebook post as, quote, a murdering little bastard, guilty of snuffing out the life of this unique, self-aware, intelligent, social, sentient being. Within hours, Apasengok was receiving death threats. The justification for calling for the death of a teenager on the internet was his absolute lack of connection with bowhead whales. At this point, social media descended, as it tends to do, into an impasse. The avowed lovers of whales took to their barricades and indigenous families and activists to theirs. But Chris Apasengok and Paul Watson both invoke in their discussions of whales a deep bond and a profound relationship with bowheads. Both have labored in the service to that relationship but their conclusions of what kind of labor is acceptable between people and bowheads are diametrically opposed. What I want to do in this talk is explore how we got to this impasse through a history of how people have related to bowheads and then move into a slightly more speculative place than the one that I usually inhabit as a historian to ask what we might take from the past of humans and whales to think about the present and the future of our relationships with between the human and the non-human in this time that some people have started to call the Anthropocene. It's a story that I'm going to tell through three groups of whalers, one group of environmentalists, and in what we might speculate that we can know about the whales themselves. And I'm going to be doing so quickly, so please forgive the ways in which I am inevitably going to flatten the historical, the cultural, and the animal particularity in what is to come. I'm going to start um, back on St. Lawrence Island um, with the first group of whalers that I want to discuss more thoroughly, which are the Yupik, the people amongst uh, the other folks around the Bering Strait who have the longest relationship with bowhead whales of anyone on earth. And on St. Lawrence Island, this long-term relationship between people and bowhead whales is very clear simply from walking around the town where jaw bones like these from bowhead whales um, line the beach outside people's houses. It is very clear on this uh, beach, on this community, that the death of whales is what sustains people's lives. Historically, that connection has been even closer. Um, people used bowhead jaw bones and uh, rib bones to make their homes, as in the case with this uh, now abandoned house in the village of Ivan, which is on the Russian side of the Bering Strait, um, not terribly far, in fact, almost within sight um, of Gamble on St. Lawrence Island. For a whale to become somebody's house, it has to die. And the people killing these bowheads, both historically and into the present, understand them as part of a universe that does not have the hard dividing line between object and subject um, that structures much of Western thought. Walruses and whales and the stones in the hillside and the character of the tides were all subjects who actively helped compose the world and create the terms of human social life. Someone described this to me um, on the Russian side of the Bering Strait as being like walking through a field of grass and looking down and seeing each blade as a snake watching you. Human beings in this world act alongside these other natural beings and souls. And whales were sort of one amongst many in this kind of cacophonous polyphonic landscape. But whales were also particular reciprocating constitutive parts of a social world that transcended the human. 
whales had a special ability to judge human beings, to kind of watch them from afar, uh, from their own country in Yupik terms, and assess whether or not human beings were worthy of the moral laws that originated in whales and in whale country. This meant that if people were not good to each other, were not generous and caring and helpful, whales would see this um, and choose not to visit, not come close enough to villages like Avon or Gamble to be hunted. And in both the oral histories and the present practice of Yupik communities, it's understood that whales make from these judgments choices about whether or not they will choose to be hunted. Whalers describe how whales swim alongside a boat opposite the harpooner, often for long periods of time, as if obsessing, um, observing or assessing the hunters until they choose to either swim close to the harpoon or to leave. This interpretation of whale behavior by Yupik whalers is that whales choose to die based on their own ethical judgments and that their death is an act of care and creation, allowing human beings to continue living. And out of this emerges an ethics in which it is not people alone who make the terms of correct behavior. To be a good and worthy person is to live up to standards of beings who are not human. I cannot unfortunately ask the whales about their motives. Um, I wish I could, given that they live for two centuries, it would make my job as a historian ever exciting if I could actually interview them. But what you can say from the historical record is that for thousands of years, the experience of human beings that bowhead whales had was one in which the interaction was a limited danger. There were over 20,000 bowheads in the Bering Sea historically, probably as many as 30,000, and 100 or fewer were killed each year out of that population. So human contact was relatively limited. All of this changes in 1848, which is where we get to the second group of whalers. When bowheads uh, became subject of hunts by another kind of uh, person, another culture. In this case, it were commercial whalers who were shipping from New Bedford, Massachusetts um, and Nantucket and Providence, where I am now, who arrived in the Bering Strait essentially because they had killed their way through the whale species they could hunt closer to home. The first ship into the Bering Strait described fat whales yielding hundreds of barrels of oil each who had no fear of harpoons. Whales that in fact, as one logbook put it, seemed to offer themselves up to die. What these commercial whalers from the East Coast did with whale death operated from a very different way of valuing whales than that of the Yupik hunters nearby. For one thing, whalers did not eat um, much whale meat they certainly brought none of the whale meat back to the East Coast, nor did they live inside the bones of whales. Instead, they had come north in order to supply a commercial commodity market, uh, one in which whale oil was increasingly valuable um, as a light source upon, uh, for, for a variety of purposes, um, but particularly domestic lighting um, and factory lighting in the kind of growing population of the Eastern seaboard of the United States. They also killed whales of baleen whales like bowheads because of the property of the baleen, which is the kind of straining mechanism in the mouth of a whale, um, which can be heated up and bent and will retain its shape much like a kind of stiff plastic and was used for all sorts of things from umbrella stays to um, buggy whips, but was particularly desired as part of women's corsets. So if I had been a middle-class or upper-class woman in Providence um, in the 1850s, I would have likely been wearing whalebone essentially next to my skin. Commercial whalers were also incentivized to kill whales at an incredibly high rate. Um, they were paid for their work, not in a salary or a wage, but as a percentage of the share of the catch when they returned back to their home ports. So if they didn't fill up their holds with whale oil, um, or pounds of baleen, they ran the risk of running, of earning only a few dollars for 20 or 30 months spent at sea 
doing work that was at turns extraordinarily monotonous or incredibly dangerous. But this is not to say that whalers didn't observe whales as beings um, with a kind of selfhood or intelligence. Their diaries are filled with descriptions of the ways in which whale mothers protected infants, um, into which whalers often read all kinds of 19th century maternal politics. And many whalers spoke of the pain and anguish that they saw in the eyes of the animals that they killed. And some sense of the ways in which these 19th century whalers related to their prey can be seen in a certain kind of marginalia that emerges in their logbooks, in which the log keepers will literally put words in the mouths um, of the whales that they're pursuing, as in the case of this sperm whale um, on the, the left-hand side, whose word bubble says, not this time, that's a whale that got away. Um, and then the, the two whales that are under the numerals 1343 are saying, we'll die like heroes, which is an interesting observation. It also means that whalers' logbooks like these are actually really rich texts for seeing whale behavior because the men who were keeping the logs were in the business of keeping very good track of what whales were up to. And they observed very closely how two years after the Yankee whaling fleet arrived in the Bering Strait, so in 1850, the bowhead whale's behavior changed pretty noticeably. Instead of coming close uh, to the whaling ships, um, as we saw in those early images, the whales retreated as soon as they saw or heard whaling ships approach into the sea ice. And some of the uh, descriptions in whaling logbooks and eventually even in whalers' uh, sea shanties start describing bowhead whales as growing wild and canny um, and otherwise learning how to evade these ships um, quite effectively. And in fact, so effectively, um, and here we come back to the agency of animals, that for a number of years in the mid 1850s, the Yankee fleet withdrew from the Bering Strait completely. Um, the Bowhead whales had made it so dangerous for these Moby Dick style tall ships to approach the edge of the sea ice, the captains decided not to take the risk, um, even though the, the number of bowheads was still very robust. So one might, if you're being specul speculative um, and take seriously the interpretation of bowhead behavior that Yupik whalers have, Note here that the whales seem to have rejected the idea of dying for the market. And they did at least, according to what records we have, continue to die for Yupik and other indigenous hunters in the same period. But unfortunately for the bowheads, commercial hunters did eventually learn how to better navigate around the edges of the sea ice and use different kinds of ships in order to make their way into the Bering Strait. Um, and came back north in force by the 1860s. And the whalers on these ships, despite the intimacy of the labor of whale killing, and despite an increasing um, and very kind of explicit discussion of the ways in which the industry was potentially hunting the animals into extinction, had no formal way of recognizing the value of a living whale. The only ways in which whales ended up um, earning money for anyone, becoming kind of a tangible form of material value for these whalers um, was in the logbooks, or is clear in the logbooks that they keep, um, where whales are most often simply reduced to the number of barrels of oil and the pounds of baleen that they produced. And many uh, log keepers would stamp their whale books as in the middle of this image, um, and in that hollow space in the whale's belly, write the number of barrels of oil that the um, particular carcass produced, sort of directly reducing the living whale down to its commodity value. And as a result of this kind of overwhelming pressure, uh, both in terms of earning an individual salary and in operating in a society that didn't have a formal way of valuing whales when they were anything but dead, the 19th century whaling fleet killed their way through the bowheads um, until there were almost none left to kill. This resulted in not infrequent famine amongst Yupik communities on St. Lawrence Island and elsewhere around the Bering Strait. Um, but 
even that did not actually provoke a major change. Um, it was in fact the development of spring steel in 1907, which replaced um, the use of baleen and the, the kind of gradual uptick in kerosene and other fossil fuel derivatives that in fact caused the collapse of the 19th century whaling industry. So that's two groups of whalers. The third group um, is a 20th century phenomenon and moves us across the Bering Strait um, into what had by then become the Soviet Union. And the 20th century kind of phenomenon of whaling um, starts only a few decades after the end of the, the wooden ship era. Um, it is originally driven by the Norwegians uh, who perfect both a new kind of whaling ship, these large factory type um, operations with huge harpoons, um, massive engines and smaller ships that could kind of pursue whales at great speed um, around them. Um, and also find, found a way of refining whale fat to reduce the, the kind of whale flavor to it, um, which allowed Norway and then Great Britain and Germany um, to use whale blubber for margarine. So in the 1930s, if you were spreading margarine on your toast in the UK or in Norway, there's a pretty decent chance that the fat in it came from whales. And by the 1930s, the Soviet Union was also starting to join in this newly industrialized large scale uh, whaling hunt. And unlike the previous kind of generation of, of wooden whaling ships, the Soviets um, and other kind of industrial whaling fleets could kill a far greater variety um, of whale species. So in the Bering Sea, they could hunt from the few remaining bowhead whales, but could also kill species that had been far too fast or too large uh, for the previous era of ships, whales like humpbacks, sperms, gray whales, blue whales, fin whales, the last two in particular are huge species um, that simply were impossible to tackle with the 19th century equipment. And in the Soviet Union, the reason for killing whales um, was not to sell them on the market the way that uh, the 19th century had operated, but to make them part of the Soviet production plan. And here I'm going to collapse um, months of work in what I think was the world's coldest archive um, into a very brief discussion of what um, the Soviet kind of ideology, how it intersected with the whales themselves. As many of you in this particular audience know, um, Marx and Engels, the kind of inspiring theorists of the Soviet project, left um, the Bolsheviks um, and the later the Soviet bureaucracy with a very clear sense of what capitalism was um, and what needed to be rejected in the capitalist way of being. The alienated labor conditions, the immiseration of workers, and the extraordinary inequity between labor and capital. But what Marxism did not leave, or the kind of Marxist corpus, was a particularly clear sense of what socialism itself or full-blown communism was supposed to look like in kind of granular terms. How do you know that you have arrived in this kind of utopian condition? Because um, the utopia is notoriously hard to describe. By the 1920s and 1930s, one way of imagining progress toward this utopia, however, had come to be seen as providing more material plenty and more production in the country as a whole, as a way of kind of rising toward this challenge of radical equality. And this leads the Soviet Union, as many, many historians have noted before me, to emphasize expanding the kind of level of production um, very heavily, particularly during the Stalinist Cultural Revolution. Um, but generally speaking, it was a country that despite um, many challenges in doing so, emphasized the idea of increasing what it was that their industries produced. From tractors to wheat to pigs to shoes, um, most industries in the Soviet Union had a set target for every year. Um, it was bad not to meet this target. Um, in some periods of Soviet history, it was very bad to not meet this target. It was very good to meet the plan and it was even better to exceed the kind of planned levels of production that were set forth in Moscow for each industry per year. And whales at first made an extremely good part of the Soviet plan. 
And part of this is because of the fact that the Soviet Union was using a kind of technology that allowed them to kill whale species that had never been hunted by human beings before, particularly those blue and fin whales. And the Soviet whaling program fell under the Department of Fisheries. So whales killed counted as tons of fish products bought back. And you can imagine killing a blue whale that weighs 100 tons produces an enormous range of products. Um, the Soviet whaling books are filled with kind of examples of this quantification that go on for literally thousands of pages, where a single whale is divided down into the number of pounds of bone meal, the number of grams of vitamins extracted from the liver, um, the number of pounds of fat um, and meat and other products were extracted from an individual carcass. So in a, in a world that um, gave many incentives to meeting the plan in a material sense, whales could be divided and subdivided and counted and recounted in ways that very much met this in the early years of the whaling program. And in some ways, there is a kind of obsession with or a practice of quantification in the Soviet whaling journals that while less illustrated um, with doodles around the edges than the Yankee whalers has a very similar emphasis on turning whales into numerical uh, lists of parts. And like the Yankee whalers, what falls out of these kinds of accounts of whales in general is affect um, or acknowledgement of whales as doing work in the world and being valuable when they're alive. And this was also despite the ways that like the capitalist whalers, many socialist harpooners um, and others on board the factory fleet um, made observations of whales at the points of their harpoons. They saw the same kinds of attachments between mother whales and infants, um, between pods of whales as they schooled together and tried to protect themselves from being hunted. They saw how whales learned to avoid their ships um, as best they could, much as had happened in the 19th century, although less effectively due to the speed of um, the diesel technology. And Soviet marine biologists, um, many of whom were working aboard these whaling fleets, were actually far ahead of their counterparts in the West in taking the sociability um, of whales seriously, and particularly in crediting whale song and whale vocalizations uh, with communication um, and very sophistic sophisticated communication. But this experience on the part of the whalers, um, which in some cases they described in very visceral detail, um, one whaler later recalled being thankful that whales couldn't scream because it would have made his work completely intolerable. And despite the observations of this kind of professional group of marine biologists uh, who worked on the ship, um, these observations really did not mesh with kind of the, the ideological goals of the state. In those goals, the more whales killed, the greater the production, the greater the production, the more valid the promises of incipient communist utopia. And for many people aboard the ships, there were direct material benefits uh, to killing more whales from bonuses in pay um, to being heralded on their return to port um, as heroes of the socialist revolution. As a result, most of the work of marine biologists on whale populations and particularly on population decline was tied up with string, stamped as classified and dropped into an archive rather than being incorporated into the socialist planning process. So I wanna step back for a minute and observe here that capitalist and socialist whaling have two kind of very general things in common. First of all, the whalers themselves did not operate in a world or some world views that let them act on any sort of relationship other than that of extraction, not officially. The values that they served were set by distant people, by consumers in New York or planners in Moscow. And I'm hardly the first historian to diagnose the problems of commodification, particularly the separation between the sites of production and where things are consumed. But in that relationship, as it pertains to whales, I see the denial of the labor and the knowledge of whales and whalers both. One word for this might be dehumanized labor, except it is more than that. 
It is labor that is stripped of any formal ways of recognizing the role of non-human things in production. And secondly, the extraction in both of these cases, different as they are in ideological terms, fed dreams of endless growth. And these are dreams that at an abstract level reject death. Instead, imagining that human futures are an endless line growing ever upward into some beyond that is not bound by the cyclical pull of death and birth. It is a teleology of freedom that emerges first from being completely liberated from any of the wants and the whims of natural processes. But of course, where it begins in production, any line of economic growth is fed by death and by entropy on the entropic acts that in this case killed their way through entire oceans and robbed whales, not just of their fellows, but the world of the work that whales do. In this, whaling was like dozens of other economic activities based first on death that was made invisible at the last to the people who actually consume it. So that's our three groups of whalers. Now we have our one group of environmentalists. And this is where I get to come back to Paul Watson. And as I noted, Watson was an early member of Greenpeace which formed initially as an anti-nuclear organization. But when Greenpeace learned that both the United States and the Soviet Union used the oil from sperm whales heads to lubricate intercontinental ballistic missiles, the group turned to saving whales with an understanding that the fates of both cetaceans and human beings were deeply bound up with each other. In 1975, after having spent quite a bit of time observing gray whales off the coast um, of uh, off the Pacific coast, they collaborated rather ironically for an anti-nuclear organization with the Department of Defense to find the coordinates of the Soviet whaling fleet. Um, the Department of Defense thought the Soviets couldn't possibly be whaling for any good reason and assumed they were a spy front. So it was interested in kind of driving them off um, and find a, the Soviet Dalnivostok um, uh, catcher ships and central factory ship off the coast of California. And using rubber boats and kind of a larger fishing vessel, Greenpeace activists um, shot footage of a whale being killed. Um, you can go find it on Greenpeace's website. Um, and Watson sat on the back of one of the sperm whales um, as it died. And his mission, like those with him in the Greenpeace, was in exposing death. And it's a necessary function, you might argue, and I would be prone to agree, since by the time Greenpeace activists took to the seas to protest Soviet whaling, the dominant models of human engagement with whale species, outside of a few indigenous villages whaling in the Bering Strait, had become making them parts of the Soviet plan. And this was killing that was going on at a large scale um, from the North Pacific all the way to the Antarctic. Greenpeace and Watson wanted to assert the living value of whales by making their deaths public and terrible, and really to make the entropy that was at the root of Soviet harvesting a public fact. But Watson eventually went beyond simply protesting the industrial scale harvesting of whales um, to a desire to stop it anywhere by anyone at any time, which is what brings us back to St. Lawrence Island in the summer of 2017. And if I liked Paul Watson better, um, and if he wasn't in the business of threatening teenagers, I would here apologize to him because I am making him essentially stand in for an entire worldview, which is never a particularly fair thing to put on an individual. But it's a worldview that even in its environmentalist form, I want to argue keeps a very hard line between human beings and what we might call nature, the world that we inhabit. The politics of Watson's attack on Chris Passengok is really just the inverted politics of industrial production. If industry can only possibly see whales as valuable when they're dead, then the answer is to only see them when they're valuable alive. And it is fundamentally another argument that renounces death, not the denial of entropy through endless 
invisible consumption, but the death of whales at all. It's a vision that retains a strict separation between people and the rest of the world, making Watson an inheritor of practices of ignoring entropy, either by separating consumption from production or by imagining that we're above consuming at all, which is just another way of imagining that human beings live in a state of exception from the rest of nature, that we possess an agency that grants us great freedom. The freedom at first to create our ethics alone out of the world. But to live in the Arctic as I have had the chance to do is to understand the inevitability of death and what curtails our freedoms. To rise on an Arctic morning and walk out into the world is to understand that you might not walk back in your particular bodily form. We're not at the top of the food chain there, even with a 30 6 rifle and good aim. To walk out in the morning is to recognize personal dependence on the persons of others and the decisions they make. Perhaps I will be their food, perhaps they will be mine. It is also a world where it is particularly clear that being alive as a human person requires our participation in death. It is not an environment in which you can retreat into the comforts of vegetation because there are simply not enough plants to eat. If you want to be alive in the world, something at some point must die. But in the Anthropocene, even here in Providence, even in a life lived without ever touching animal flesh, something somewhere is still always dying. And in the case of whales, many somethings. This is true even now that no one in this Zoom call is wearing lipstick made out of whale or eats whale margarine. Our habits of consumption are still deeply involved um, in killing them from the right whales off the coast of Providence um, and up the Eastern seaboard who are essentially going extinct in real time due to increased shipping traffic and fishing to the ongoing large scale strandings of gray whales on the Pacific coast for reasons that likely have to do with climate change in part to the sperm whales stranding all over the world with stomachs so full of plastic that they can no longer digest food. That is, for those of us in this Zoom room, our way of life is participating in extinction at a mass level. And it does so at a scale that mocks Watson's desire for purity and for some kind of withdrawal. And indeed, I think makes that desire seem rather naive. Instead, we don't have an option of retreating of some kind of exit from consuming the world. All of us, are beings that do not photosynthesize. We cannot do the work of those diatoms and algaes at the beginning of this talk. And so we must consume from something. The question is how to do that well. And this is where I get to my speculative final conclusion. One way of reading the history of humans and whales over the last several millennia is as a history in which whales intimated through their behavior what kind of relationship they would prefer or will tolerate with human beings. If we take seriously the understanding of bowheads from the people who know them best, from the Yupik and Anupiak and Chukchi whalers, and if we take seriously the insights of contemporary marine biologists and behaviorists who speak of bowheads' capacity to communicate with each other, and in fact, think of them as animals that bear culture, then it is perhaps not so far-fetched to imagine that part of finding that ethics of consumption comes from listening to or paying attention to what it is that we actually consume. To the animals, in this case, the bowheads, um, who have offered through their actions, and here it is, I am speculating wildly, for I cannot pin any of these things down at this point as a historian, but have offered an argument for the kind of relationship that they would prefer to have with people. It is a relationship where human beings remain dependent on whales, um, do not assert a, the kind of dominance that emerged out of the processes of killing that the, both the capitalist and the socialist systems brought to the North Pacific and the Bering Sea in the 19th and 20th century. Less speculatively, including lived observations of whales 
would make for far different terms of labor and a far different ethics of killing than have ideologies and methods of production which deny both workers and whales the capacity to generate relationships with each other that are anything other than extractive. Labor, be it socialist or capitalist, that reduces the world only to the tallied commodities of profit or plan impoverishes a society's moral imagination. It is blind not just to the death necessary to sustain life, but to the wills, the emotions, and even the ethical judgments of other living beings. Thank you. Um, thank you so much for a really thought-provoking uh, talk and presentation. Um, I have many questions, as I'm sure many in the audience do. Uh, so we invite you to um, send in your questions now using the Q&A uh, feature uh, at the bottom of your screen. Um, and perhaps if I if I may start um, with with a question. Uh, so I, I have a number of them, but you know, one thing that continually came to my mind as you were talking about death and the meaning of death and the meaning of life um, is how central, um, you know, in, in many societies, religion is to considering these kinds of questions. And I was wondering um, whether in your work, um, you do consider religion at all or the religion or spirituality of the, um, you know, of the agents uh, that you're studying? That's such a good question. Um, and a place where I always feel a lot of my depth since I'm not a historian of religion. Um, although I think, as you point out, we all often are by um, sim simply the material that we're in contact with. Um, and I think, there, there is a religious aspect, um, certainly when thinking about Yubik and other indigenous practices, one way to understand them is, is religious. Um, sometimes I think that that's, that's too narrow or boxes off spiritual practices from more material ones because of people's understanding of what a religion is, you know, being kind of the, the formal practices of something like Christianity or Buddhism. Um, but certainly there is a spiritual aspect to how whales are understood and, and related to that's that's critical to this kind of ethics of hunting. And religion has a really kind of fascinating presence in the history of the 19th century whalers. Um, and um, uh, Graham Burnett at Princeton has written about this some, and I have a grad student who's actually writing about it more specifically, the kind of ways in which whales, which certainly show up biblically and have a great deal of meaning. Not everyone on these crews was Christian by any means, but generally speaking, that was kind of the um, the religion held by the leaders in the in a hierarchical sense. And so often kind of saturated the ships, people took Sundays off um, and were kind of expected to hold to the Sabbath in some, some other ways. Um, that the, the, the kind of understanding of whales is filtered through that, um, but often particularly by people who are less high up the hierarchy, there was a sense of kind of um, shared damnation between whales and people um, that shows up in kind of an interesting way that the, the work of whaling was considered to be sufficiently terrible that there, there, there are ways in which the whalers speak of kind of having a kinship with the whales that they're killing on kind of a spiritual level. Um, and I think in the Soviet case, I mean, this gets into the, um, the, the totally impossible task that my former advisor at Berkeley has taken head on, which is whether or not you think of socialism as practiced in the Soviet Union as a religion. <laughs> um, and, you know, I think certainly in the sense that it, it was a worldview that implied a set of kind of correct moral behaviors in the present and a and had a cosmology about what the future should be, you can read that into it and that, that whaling could fall into parts of that. Um, the actual kind of practice of religion on the whale ships, again, is kind of a fascinating, these were highly multi-ethnic spaces um, and in the post-Second World War era could have some really interesting ways of thinking about the appropriateness of any sort of you know, non-Soviet religious practice. Um, which I think Ryan Tucker Jones, who's writing a book about Soviet whaling, 
um, gets into a little bit more than I do. Thank you. Um, and we've had a couple of questions come in. Um, uh, one is from Christina Hill, who's a student um, in the master's program in Russian East European Studies. And she asks, were you able to find any differences between indigenous groups across the Bering Strait and perhaps in other parts of the world as you did your research? Or is it, as you mentioned, a shared relationship amongst the tribes? That's a very good question. Um, there's a there's a great deal of difference both at an individual level and a community level in terms of the kinds of practices toward um, kind of whaling appropriately. There um, there's kind of this overall emphasis on understanding the whale's behavior, um, kind of watching the whale's behavior, intimating from it whether or not the whale is kind of consenting to death. Um, there's there's kind of a, a layer that's kind of common and then um, there's a whole set of ceremonies and practices, um, many of which are really not mine to to get into discussing um, that are kind of unique to particular whaling families and communities. Um, but the um, the kind of importance of whaling is not is certainly not a universal like even if you go with, down to the Aleutian Islands. Um, which is that kind of ring of islands at the that spits out of Alaska and almost goes over into Russia. Um, there is not a, a whaling tradition there. And in fact, whaling is seen as like kind of an untoward thing to do that you wouldn't go out and kill whales. Um, so it's it's hardly a universal, as is the case with you know many things in indigenous societies, right? They're they're highly varied and particular and have um, you know their own internal um, differences between each other within a, within a space. And, and globally, um, I'm sure there are many more differences and I simply don't know them. Um, following on, there's another question from one of our master's students, um, Saga Helgeson Morris, and she asks, have you explored the whaling traditions in Greenland at all? Uh, she's also interested in knowing your thoughts on the tension between whaling and whale tourism, namely whale watching, um, as it is increasingly popular in uh, both Greenland and Iceland? Yeah, those are great questions. And I am not an Atlantic Arctic specialist by any means. So um, there are many people who know more about this than I do. Um, the, the, the Inuit whalers, both in very northeastern Canada and into Greenland, um, share a great deal culturally with the Inupiaq in, um, in Alaska. So there are some kind of very broad generalizations um, between those whaling practices. Um, my understanding on the, the tourism side is that the, particularly in Iceland, um, which does not have an indigenous population, it's a, it's a European population, um, the, the tension is between industrial whaling that Iceland has actually decided recently to give up um, and whale watching. Um, and that there, I think three years ago, there were some very tense moments when people on their whale watching boats were out looking for fin whales that were actually being actively hunted. Um, and that that was not a great, um, it wasn't great for the tourists <laughs> that way. Um, and Iceland has since kind of backed away. They were basically, ironically, killing whales to feed tourists because there aren't very many places in the world that you can eat whale. Iceland is one of them. Um, so there was kind of a market for whale meat to feed tourists, but there's also a market for tourists to see live whales. And it seems like Iceland has mostly sided with the live whale um, kind of prerogatives rather than the, the hunting. Um, I think a lot of that also has to do with kind of international pressure that it's, you know, it's a place where you can get a lot of opprobrium um, and then avoid it quite easily if you don't kill whales. Um, so if I, if I may ask uh, another question, something that uh, sort of struck me as you were talking about um, the three different groups uh, is actually how much they had in common, um, you know, more, more than not. Uh, these are groups that would not necessarily recognize commonality amongst each other ideologically or in other ways. And yet as, as the way that they engage as you were showing, um, you know, with, with this particular geographical space and 
and the whales, you know, there, there was a lot of commonality and a lot of what it reminded me of, perhaps unsurprisingly, is this sort of, you know, um, they're all foreigners there, right? There's this all, there's, there's this um, dynamic of kind of being outsiders. Um, to me, it seems they all in different ways embody what we sort of very now generally you know, talk about as a Western view. Um, and so, you know, as you were speaking, I was wondering, in addition to their differing relationships with the whales, you know, what kinds of relationships did they have actually with the indigenous populations, if any at all, when they were present? And sort of related to that, were there laws governing um, the seas mm -hmm. um, that might provide some sort of common framework for these interactions? Those are both great questions, um, and they get at things that I like left out of this talk that are fairly <laughs> important parts of the overall history. Um, so the the relationship between whalers and kind of indigenous whalers and outsider whalers um, is is actually pretty different between the the Soviet period and the capitalist one. Um, quite a few indigenous people would actually hire on to the 19th century whale ships. Um, particularly after the 19 or the 1870s and 1880s, um, which was a period of real food crisis in the Bering Strait um, because of a large scale whaling. And there was also a large scale walrus killing um, kind of operation going on. And there was also kind of a just an ebb in caribou populations and hare populations. Like it was a very difficult time to feed yourself. Um, so people started signing on to whaling crews. Um, to be paid um, so they could buy food. And in that case, there's a lot more kind of direct interaction, right? Like indigenous whalers learning English, um, working with people in whale boats. And it's, you know, it's like one of the most communal forms of labor you can imagine, right? You're in a tiny boat, there's a giant animal. Um, and so in that sense, there was, there was actually quite a lot. And how much actually gets communicated between all of the language barriers and many of these crews were already pretty polyglot <laughs> so it's a little hard to tell um but there was certainly kind of a direct participation and whaling captains often wrote about how effective it was to have you know Yupik or chukchi whalers on their crews because they really knew what they were doing um in the soviet period the soviet union really tries to basically get um chukchi and Yupik whalers out of the business of whaling directly so the big industrial fleets, um, as far as I can tell from the records I've seen, which are I don't think are complete, but are fairly complete, there were almost no um, indigenous, nobody whose you know, sort of passport indicated that they were um, from the indigenous uh, groups in the north. Um, lots of people from Ukraine and from various parts of the Soviet Union, but um, not a lot of native whalers. And even up along the coast, the Soviet Union started using these kind of small catcher ships uh, to go after gray whales and then would kind of drag them ashore for local people to use. So they sort of took, ironically for the Soviet Union, they took the means of production out of local communities' hands. Um, so there was a lot of collaboration um, between marine biologists and indigenous peoples in studying whales, but a little bit less in the actual whaling um, practice. And in, in terms of kind of the, the legal picture in the 19th century, there were laws pertaining to whale ships flying particular flags um, that had to do with things like, uh, there was a real anti-corporal punishment movement, for example, in the mid 19th century, trying to get captains to beat their crews less. And those were kind of laws, but they came from the United States and were only for US flagged ships um, and didn't have anything to do with whales. Um, and there were some attempts to have them kind of, there was worry that whalers were terrible ambassadors of civilization. <laughs> um, and so there were some attempts to kind of regulate, you know, or what are you selling native people? Are you selling them guns? Are you selling them alcohol? Um, mostly ineffective because they were completely unpoliced. Um, and then in the 20th century, after the second world war, the International Whaling Commission kind of officially has uh, regulations, they're, they're not enforceable laws uh, for whaling countries, um, which set quotas for how many whales were kind of legally permissible to kill. Um, 
the Soviet Union by the 1960s is very much, it was a signatory to the International Whaling Commission, but was violating it with gusto. Um, and so it was the, the kind of prerogatives of the plan very much outweigh the prerogatives of the international kind of legal framework. Um, and they basically just handed over falsified records um, to indicate that they were not whaling out of turn. Um, but it, it's, it's now quite clear um, that they were. Um, thank you. And in the meantime, we've had uh, one more question um, come in and perhaps we end on this one. Um, um, some from uh, Sonia Chavalini, uh, who first thanks you for an amazing talk um, and asks if tracking technologies are used uh, today to help keep whales safe um, by making it easier to map their populations. So there, there are um, trackers used on the East Coast for um, North Atlantic right whales, which are one of the most endangered whale species in the world, um, in an attempt to kind of warn ships away from where the right whales are hanging out. Um, there aren't at the moment in the in the Bering Strait, a lot of tagging for that kind of purpose. There's some just to sort of map, um, you know, whales migrations because there's a lot that scientists still don't know about them. Um, but there, there might be cause for it in the coming decades because the, as climate change is reducing the sea ice in the Arctic Ocean, um, there, we're within a couple of summers essentially of having a very easily navigable um, sea route the, the northern sea route of which the Soviet Union put so much emphasis um, is actually going to be kind of a practical way to move goods from, from China to Europe um, in the next couple of decades. And that's gonna radically increase the shipping traffic through the Bering Strait. And you know all of those large cargo ships have to go through this 50 mile passage, which is the same 50 mile passage that bowheads go through. Um, and so there are a lot of questions about what that means for the bowhead whales, which are otherwise actually doing really well. They're a healthy population, they're growing, they're heading back toward their 19th century pre-commercial killing numbers. Um, but th there's a lot of concern about shipping and there has been discussion if you could sort of track them. Um, but you can imagine that the prerogatives of shipping companies, which are to get from, you know, <laughs> Chinese ports to European ports as fast as possible don't necessarily include a lot of um, good humor for stopping for the whales, um, but that, that remains to be seen. Yeah. Um, thank you again. We've had another just comment come in um, remarking how impressive your presentation has been. Um, I know that I have certainly not only learned a great deal, but started thinking about things differently, which um, I think is, is what one always hopes to walk away from a presentation doing. So thank you so much for your time today, for sharing your expertise. Um, and um, you know, thank you for, for just really a great presentation. Thank you so much. Um, it was a real pleasure to join you remotely. <laughs> yes, and hopefully we see you in person at some point in the future. <laughs> Sooner than later. Thank you, everyone. Bye. <laughs>